Jeff Brown. Always good to talk to you, my friend. How are you? Good morning. Good, good to morning, have you friend. on. Uh, Jeff, I was reading Saturday uh, something from, uh, what was it, Morgan Stanley? I can't remember. Uh, one of the big financial firms. And they were showing uh, what's happening with ESG and the whole plan. And it got to 3031, and it said fusion plants to provide baseline energy. And I thought, gee, that's eight years away. How's that going to happen? The next day, I hear that we are announcing fusion energy. So I come to three conclusions, and I want, I want to see what you think. A, the big oil companies have always put fusion and hidden all that technology. We've had it forever, but oil, big oil, stopped it. I don't believe that. Second, um, <clears throat> the, um, the government... Uh, has uh, uh, fusion and it's ready to go and it's going to be remarkable and it's going to happen quickly. Or the third option is they know we're close to something and this is a way to get people excited like a moonshot and get everybody on board with a public-private partnership to pioneer this technology with no idea whether or not we're going to be the ones that find it, but we might as well try a moonshot. Which one of those, or is it something else? Well, Glenn, the, 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 closest, the closest one of the scenarios that you described is definitely the third one. Right. Um, you, you know, there are a large number of different approaches that are being tested around the world uh, of, of nuclear fusion reactors and it's very experimental at this stage. Um, generally speaking, we all know that it's going to work. It's just a matter of figuring out uh, which one or ones, which approaches are going to uh, really be the most effective in terms of producing limitless clean energy. Um, you know, the technology, historically, um, we just haven't had the material science. Uh, we haven't had the artificial intelligence to manage these incredibly complex plasma reactions under immense heat and immense pressure. Uh, but the whole industry has been advancing at an incredible pace over the last three years in particular uh, that we're right on the cusp, that inflection point where we've actually produced a net energy output reaction. We produced a lot of fusion reactions for milliseconds or in some cases a few seconds, but they haven't been net energy output. Um, they've, they've required more energy to create and maintain the action, uh, the reaction than um, the energy that was actually produced from the fusion reaction. So let me show you the re read to you the exact report. The report yeah. offers some reason to be careful as two of the sources said the greater than expected energy output of 2.5 megajoules of energy in the experiment, using 2.1 megajoules of energy in the lasers, uh, damaged diagnostic equipment so they couldn't measure. Initial diagnostic data suggests another successful experiment at the National Ignition Facility. However, the exact yield is still being determined, and we can't confirm that it's over the threshold. That analysis is in process, so publishing the information before that process is complete would be inaccurate. So... We're at exactly the same place we've been for a while. We, we don't know if we have it. We haven't been able to measure these. Well, uh, we may know as early as tomorrow. It sure sounds like they've had a net energy output reaction. And it's worth, it's worth mentioning that, um, you know, Lawrence Livermore uh, Laboratory um, has had successful fusion reactions in the past. They had a big breakthrough earlier this year. Um, their approach is quite different. They use uh, a bunch of lasers, 192 to be exact, that they focus on some fuel to create that intense pressure and the intense heat that causes um, uh, the hydrogen to, um, to combine into helium, which releases the energy. They've been able to demonstrate that before. So to me, it wouldn't be a surprise at all if the news is confirmed uh, tomorrow or later this week that they, in fact, have had a net energy output. 
So what kind of a net energy output do you need to be the miracle we're looking for? Well, I mean, the reality is anything greater than, than one, in other words, uh, more energy output than the energy required to sustain the, the reaction is a win. Um, but the reality is we actually don't have to sacrifice. The technology, um, uh, when implemented, when proven to be successful and no, no longer theoretical, you'll be able to manage a, a nuclear fusion reaction um, and create 10 units of energy for every one unit of input. Now, what that means is basically almost free, limitless, completely clean energy for the planet. It's extraordinary. So what kind of energy do you need to fuel it? Would we still have to have fossil fuels to fuel it? Or can you skim off the top to refuel? I mean... No, this is the this is the great part. The, you know, the inputs to these reactions, once you obviously have built your fusion reactor, are basically two different kinds of hydrogen. One is deuterium and one is tritium, otherwise known as um, hydrogen-2 and hydrogen-3. Um, hydrogen-2 literally can be derived from water, tap water. And hydrogen-3 is a byproduct of lithium. So these are obviously widely available that's the fuel and those are the inputs to create this limitless clean energy and you know perhaps glenn uh, another way to look at it is that if we think about an individual consumer to produce 10 years of energy for an individual consumer it only takes a few tablespoons of water and the amount of lithium that is in your smartphone Wow. One person for 10 years. That's how incredible nuclear fusion is as a source of clean energy. Holy cow. Now, they say um, that if this is true, it would still take us decades before we could open up a plant. Do you believe that to be true? No. It can happen Mm. a lot faster than that. I, I mean, I think back to when you and I sat down in your studio almost three years ago to the date. Yeah. Uh, I think it was November 2019. And at that time, I predicted that we would see this moment within five years. So before yeah. 2024. And uh, here we are. And back then, I remember the consensus in the industry was, you know, 2030 and beyond. Yeah. So, um no, it's not going to take 10 years to commercialize. Um, we're going to have compact nuclear fusion reactors uh, really within the next three years. Um, we're going to see net energy output. And then, from my perspective, it's just a matter of commercialization. So as I look into the second half of this decade, we should see at least one or two companies producing those initial compact fusion reactors to be put into commercial use for clean energy production. Like what kind of compact? What are you you talking about? For your house, for your phone, for a city? Well, in the, you know, in the industry, when we talk about a compact fusion reactor, we can imagine something roughly the size of a semi-trailer, which is exciting because you can manufacture these things, (laughs) put them on the back of a semi-trailer, ship them out to whatever neighborhood or subdivision or city metropolitan area and install these and basically connect them to the, uh, the electricity grid. And is this something that is, uh, affordable? Will it become affordable? I mean, it sounds like the resources that you need are plentiful. Yes. The, the, Engineering required is, um, while uh, technically more advanced in terms of material science, especially with regards to making these um, uh, magnets that are required uh, to contain the, this incredibly hot uh, pressurized plasma, that's really the hardest part. But the costs are going to be a lot less than a large um, uh, power production plant. 
um, because uh, fusion is such an energy dense um, right. uh, way to produce electricity uh, as opposed to, you know, a natural gas plant or a coal plant, something like that, or for that matter, a nuclear fission plant. And once you start the fusion, it doesn't stop, right? It just keeps feeding uh, like That's the right. sun. So this is the great part the, the, you know, this is in terms of operational cost. If you're producing 10 units of energy, then you can just take a portion of that energy and use it to, to fuel the, the nuclear fusion reaction. It'll just go on forever as long as you need it to 24 uh, seven. That's the beauty of these fusion reactions. And there's no risk of a meltdown at all. Um, the moment you uh, basically um, take your finger off the button, uh, basically the plasma cools down peacefully and the reaction stops and just stops producing energy. All right, back in just a second. Jeff, we know that uh, big oil kept big battery from being made. Uh, and so now, why would big battery allow fusion to happen? What does this mean for all of the battery research and the cars we're building now? Well, the... Um yeah, the industry for uh, you know, petroleum and um, uh, gasoline, of course, natural gas, th this is the one that will be the most threatened coal as well from a breakthrough like this. Um, when we have limitless, almost free, clean energy, um, no carbon emissions, no radioactive waste, um, you know, why do we need those other sources of energy? Uh, and there's obviously some very large vested interests that would probably prefer to not see this happen. But the car industry, uh, you know, this is what makes, from my perspective, electric vehicles make sense. You know, historically, right. in the U.S., 60 percent of all electricity production comes from coal and natural gas. And in fact, right. in the last two years, our usage of coal has increased from about 21% to 25% just in the last two years. I know it's counterintuitive. Um, so driving around an electric vehicle when it's fueled by electricity from fossil fuels, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if we have nuclear fusion, mm -hmm. then electric vehicles make a ton of sense uh, because we don't have to burn fossil fuels uh, to create the electricity to fuel them. All right. So, so, I, I hate to be such a pessimist, but I just have seen too many things here. Um, there's also vested interest right now, especially with ESG, to make sure that those profits happen that haven't been happening um, and are causing all kinds of problems for these big hedge funds, etc. The idea that we are on a breakthrough energy uh, would funnel a lot of money into these kinds of new technologies um, <clears throat> and help fund them. Uh, and if they're real, great. Uh, if they're a you know, Green New Deal, not so great. Um, and so there is big business and big money uh, and big government that would love to. It's just coincidental or, or, or very, very convenient that this would be announced uh, like this by the government, which would play right into their hand. Am I being too pessimistic here? Um, no, I, I don't think you are. There's just tens of billions of dollars at stake here. And uh, obviously, I mean, even if we look at the whole carbon credit industry, the, the net beneficiary of carbon credits has been the financial services industry that makes money trading these things around. They're not solving our environmental problems. Uh, you know, they haven't changed um, how energy is produced around the world. They're just a financial instrument. Right. And so this is real. This is transformational. In fact, I would argue that um, commercializing nuclear fusion technology is the single most important thing that we can do Oh, or, by far. Uh, our environment. Oh, easily, by far. Easily, right? Oh, this should be it. This, this is it. If, if you have this, this is really all you have to do. You'll take all energy um, that is being uh, manufactured and make it 100% clean. 
that that's all you have to do. That's like shutting the planet off, which they said we had to do. That's what this would be. That's right. That's right. And I, you know, the, the, the craziest thing about all of this is that as we we're so close to having this, this breakthrough is that less than $10 billion, less than $10 billion over the last three decades has been invested by the U.S. government and by the private sector mm. in nuclear fusion technology projects and companies. Now, that said, this year, 2022, was an absolute record year. It was the biggest private funding year. This whole industry has been primarily driven by a private industry, venture capitalist. Um, and uh, so in that sense, it was a breakthrough year, and that's because people can see that we're, we're really on the cusp of this breakthrough. So I think, I believe that at the government level, we're going to see a very big shift in terms of uh, levels of investment. This should be the equivalent of, you know, a Manhattan Project or an Apollo program yeah. in terms of energy policy. 